The following program is made possible by Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, the next stage. He is just about done with his first year in office and he already has been named assistant speaker pro tem and landed on the assembly budget committee. We talk state policy and politics with assemblyman Kevin Mullen, Democrat from South San Francisco. The game is politics and the game is on. I'm Kitty Lopez. And I'm Mark Simon. Welcome to the game. His legislative agenda has run the gamut from immigrant workers to tax reform. Former council member and mayor in South San Francisco, Kevin Mullen, serves on the budget, local government, revenue and taxation, and public employees committees. Elected the assembly in 2012, he is a member of the assembly um, democratic leadership in his position as assembly speaker pro tem. And he used to be a co-host on this show <laughs> before he went straight. And I suppose that's encouraging news for Kitty. There's a life after this. Kevin, welcome to the game. It's great to be here. Uh, because you're on the Public Employees Committee, we're going we're gonna to pick on that a little bit because right. it is one of the issues that seems to be really on the minds of the public, uh, public employees, their influence in state legisla legislation, mm -hmm. particularly public employees unions and pensions and compensation. And a lot of people think that system is broken. Uh, is it something you're grappling with on your committee? Uh, is that perception fair and is it accurate? Well, the perception about it being on the public's mind, I think, is, is absolutely accurate, just in, in terms of talking to folks. I think um, the BART strike has sort of, um, is shining a light on um, negotiations and pensions and, and compensation and those kinds of things. So that's always in the forefront of, of taxpayer consciousness, I guess. Um, on the committee, the PERS committee, it's the Public Employees Retirement and Social Security Committee. It's chaired by my colleague Rob Bonta from the East Bay. We had a number of informational hearings early in the session. Um, in particular, we focused on the STIR system, the State Teachers Retirement System, which um, caught my attention and is, is alarming, frankly, at some of the potential shortfalls in that system alone. Uh, we have to invest $4.5 billion additional money every year for the next 30 years to catch up to the unfunded liability. Mm -hmm. And if we can't catch up to that, that will fall on school districts primarily. So we just did the local control funding formula, investing more money in our school system. But over the long haul, um, that STIR system uh, um, is going to have some serious difficulties. So, the longer we wait to act, the more difficult the problem gets. So we need to deal with the issue. The, the PEPRA Act, the pension reform that the legislature and the governor uh, worked through um, in previous years is helping. I'm glad that the legislature engaged that issue with the governor, but it didn't fully address that unfunded liability. There are um, retiree health care obligations. And on the local level, you see um, obligations. Detroit's bankruptcy, I think, has triggered a, a new wave of analysis across the country about the financial condition that states are in. The Economist just did a special on that. Uh, California um, is in sort of the middle tier in terms of its, its um, uh, fiscal health relative to pensions. But this will absolutely be an ongoing issue. Back to the teachers issue, that will require um, state involvement, uh, district involvement and employee involvement to try to defray some of those long-term costs. So this is absolutely not going away and leaders on both sides of the aisle have to face up to that and work with our union partners to stabilize and strengthen the pension system going forward. One of the things the BART strike seems to be generating in terms of the, the public's mind is this idea that, that the benefits are a little too rich, the compensation is too high. There was a I guess when we were both younger, uh, probably me more so than anybody else at the table, that idea that, yeah, public employees got paid a little less, but their benefits and their job security were a little better. And one of the elements of that was you couldn't strike as a public employee. That's not necessarily the case. You've been a public employee, or you're actually one now. Mm -hmm. That perception uh, that the public employees are living a little too rich What's your feeling about that? Well, just looking at the BART strike, since that's generating so many headlines here, I think 
um, just in terms of the public communications, um, uh, unions um, have been painted in a negative light. Um, I think, you know, some of the um, you know, the compensation issues, the uh, lack of contribution to pension, that's been framed a certain way in the public consciousness, and that shows in, in polls. But BART management, uh, you know, some of those folks have some of the highest uh, compensation rates across the country. Now, some of this is. We are in the San Francisco Bay Area, mm -hmm. uh, a wealthy region by, by national standards. It's expensive to live in California. But the point is, both of these sides need to, I, I just think there's sort of a poisonous atmosphere right now in these negotiations. And the Bay Area as a whole and our economy is being held hostage. So the governor has asked for this um, you know, 30 day and then 60 day, so forth. He needs to insert himself, I believe, more firmly in the negotiations. He is the one politician, and you know, there's been criticism, why aren't politicians getting involved? Well, the reality is, the governor is the only one with the political standing to get in the mix there and hammer out a deal. So I think he needs to get more directly involved. We, the legislature, have sent letters imploring both sides to get a deal. Um, it's costing millions of dollars in productivity um, uh, every day that those trains don't run. So get a deal now so we don't have to encounter that. Well, Kevin, what's going to what's going to be the tipping point to have have a deal? We were talking about that before. What do you, what's your thought on that? Look, there's all sorts of posturing on on both sides, and they need to come up with a, a, a negotiated settlement. I mean, this stuff is not rocket science. You have two sides that have staked out a position, and unfortunately, sort of a poisonous atmosphere uh, in the room. I believe so. I've heard. Uh, it does sometimes take an outside force mm -hmm. with credibility on both sides to work through that, that, that almost clotting, if you will, work through that, get a better flow of communications between the two sides. And there is uh, all sorts of external pressure. I don't think we'll see a, an actual strike. I don't think trains will stop. I think we will get a deal because it's too costly for everybody um, to not get a deal. So I'm, I'm hopeful that this will be resolved before the trains stop. We're a few days away from the opening of the new Bay Bridge, even though it's actually not finished. I guess even in its unfinished state, it's still safer than continuing to use the old Bay Bridge. Um, I know you're not responsible for the Department of Transportation and all the things that went wrong in that whole project, but what's the role of the legislature going forward in understanding what happened, understanding how that would not happen again the next time there's a major statewide project? That's a great question. Uh, I don't have a precise answer for you because when you have a project of this magnitude, I think in, invariably there will be issues that emerge uh, with regard to quality and c control and so forth. Uh, I was on the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. I was able to see um, the, some of that uh, at work in terms of Steve Heminger's oversight as the, as the executive director of Metropolitan Transportation Commission. Um, I think the legislature absolutely has a role in, in looking at this entire project, audit this, figure out at what points the failures occurred in the quality control process. How can the Department of Transportation uh, better manage uh, these projects? We ultimately have oversight uh, as a legislative body. My colleague, uh, Senator DeSaulnier from the East Bay Chairs of Transportation Committee, he's held a series of uh, very pointed hearings in this regard. But we are sort of in this phase now of just getting this thing open. But there absolutely will be follow-up, there will be oversight, there will be a dissection mm -hmm. of what occurred here because it's been completely unacceptable. I have to think on projects of this magnitude, once you start picking through a project and once you really start scrutinizing, you would find errors on, on lots of large public works projects, which is not to excuse what happened. I just think there is a certain reality of projects of, these, of this magnitude, but it's still completely unacceptable because it's undermined public confidence and faith in the structure and undermine public faith and confidence in governance. I'm gonna stop you there, we're gonna take a quick break. Stay with us, we'll be right back. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo first opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support and we're passionate about returning it. 
Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Welcome back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. This is Kenny Lopez. Over here we have Assemblyman Kevin Mullen. And because he used to co-host the show, we're punishing him with a list of the most <laughs> controversial issues currently facing the region. So what's, what the heck was plunging the high-speed rail? Um, recent court ruling that uh, they may have violated Prop 1A in terms of how they did their funding. The governor says, we're still going ahead. That was then. This is now, which was one of, he didn't use that phrase, but that's one of his most famous quotes. Um, What's your take on high-speed rail? And in particular, and I should disclose, I work for Caltrain. We're depending ultimately on some funds from high-speed rail to modernize Caltrain. But that's one of the things that's at risk here is some of the funding that would be used for Caltrain. So as this unfolds, what's your take on high-speed rail? Well, that is my primary concern, is that those funds arrive in the Caltrain corridor. Um, I cannot uh, overstate how important it would be for my district, for the entire San Francisco, San Jose, Caltrain corridor to get those electrification funds. Um, I think it could be transformative just in terms of the capacity uh, of, of the train uh, system. I think it would trigger uh, transit-oriented development up and down that Caltrain corridor. I think it could be transformative. It, but it, of course, it is tied up with the high-speed rail project as a whole. Uh, it, gives me, it gives me great concern uh, re looking through the reporting around uh, the recent uh, court decision. I think it's sort of one more hurdle that's been put in the way of the project. I think it may lead to uh, additional litigation and challenges. Um, you know, we were just talking about the Bay Bridge project and a massive public works project. I mean, this project is on a, on a, on a you know, scale of magnitude much, much beyond that. So you can imagine just the number of hurdles that are in its way for it to, to um, come to completion. And we're talking, you know, 20, 30 year time horizons and those, those time horizons slip. Um, I'm most concerned about what happens by 2020 on the peninsula and what happens to Caltrain. That's where my focus has been. Uh, I am uh, jockeying a bill on the assembly floor uh, on Senator Hill's behalf. Both assembly members Gordon and I are co-authors to um, just give peninsula residents assurances that this is going to be a two-track system, not a four-track system. If there are any proposed changes, the, there are nine different entities that would have to sign off on it. There, um, and, and it ensures that you know there's 600 million that will be coming into our corridor for electrification. So I'm keeping my eye on that. I can't control what happens in the Central Valley and what happens with the courts, um, but I want to be an influence in making sure that those dollars that are out there get spent appropriately electrifying um, this system, uh, which is the commuter backbone of, of the peninsula. With those two projects, Bay Bridge and High Speed Rail, are, are we just no longer in an era where we're going to build big things? I mean, there are a lot of people who think we shouldn't be doing this kind of big, massive public works project. Proponents will say, look, we built the state highway system, the national highway system, we built the state universities. If you were to try to build a university system now, I'm sure people would say it was an expensive boondoggle. Right. So the question is, is there still room in California to dream big projects? Yes, absolutely. Um, California is the innovation capital of the country, of the world. We have the intellectual capital, the know-how, uh, I think we need to improve our governance structures, which is a whole separate conversation probably for another show, um, to sort of match the innovation that we're seeing in the private sector and, and, and our university systems. But we absolutely have the capacity to think big, to do big things. Uh, we are in an era, however, of fiscal restraint, and that's the rub, is I think there is a desire to do big things. We have a governor who wants a legacy who is sort of chasing his father's legacy, wants to do big things, and I applaud him for that. Yet at the same time, he is a, um, he's pretty fiscally responsible. Some would say a fiscal conservative on that spectrum. Some and would I don't just say he's cheap, but that's right. Okay. <laughs> but I don't think those two things, uh, you know, uh, I think those two things can coexist. You can think big because these are long-term capital projects and you amortize costs out over time. Yet in the short run, you do some things with your budget and you deal with um, um, changing the trajectory on the long-term cost structure. You can be a fiscal uh, conservative 
yet also look at these large uh, projects, capital projects, because whether you know, um, you know, there's 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 um, differing opinions on where our population is going. I think our population will continue to grow. I still think we're heading to 50 million, uh, you know, by 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 2032 or what, whatever the 2040, I think it is. Um, we are going there, so we need to change the way we grow. We need to change our land use patterns. We need to change the transportation infrastructure to accommodate that. We have to deal with water. We have to deal with our education system and, and affordable housing and do big infrastructure to accommodate growth uh, in, a, in a smart way. And also, in, in the same, at the same time, deal with climate change. We have a, a moral uh, imperative to deal uh, with these generational issues so we don't just foist these problems onto our kids and our grandkids. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about prisons and judicial realignment and all that. Um, we've got a hunger strike going on. Uh, some prisoners who are on the verge of being force fed. Um, this is a really interesting paradox because on the one hand, we're a much safer state than we were the last time Jerry Brown was governor. It's largely because we've put a lot more people in prison. It's got to be one of the reasons why. And yet it's a cost. There's a federal ruling that says we're uh, basically treating these people inhumanely. Uh, the local governments are straining with the extra prisoners they're getting because of realignment. Uh, I'm glad to see that you don't have simple problems to solve in the legislature. Um, we had a recent Democratic caucus meeting which was completely dominated by this very uh, conversation around additional release of prisoners. That's not something that I want to see. I see, um, I see realignment as something that has the promise of, of reforming our criminal justice system in, in, a, in a way that I think Jerry Brown envisioned. Yet, Let me interject. Realignment yes. means taking people who are nonviolent offenders, removing them to the state prisons and having them mm -hmm. housed in local authority, right. local jails. And <clears throat> often it means a greatly reduced sentence, but a level of oversight that they probably wouldn't be getting once they get out of prison. And with that soliloquy, we're going to take <laughs> another break. We'll come back to this topic. And you come back. Stick with us. We'll be right back. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo First opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. She's Kitty Lopez. <laughs> He's Kevin Mullen, assemblyman from South San Francisco, finishing up his first year in office and also assembly speaker pro tem. We were talking about prison reform, realignment. I posed a question, then we went to break. So why don't you go ahead? Well, I was just going to say I think the vision of realignment is a good one. Uh, I think we need to, to move our prison system uh, more toward uh, rehabilitative. We need to reduce our recid recidivism rate, which is an embarrassment. Uh, I think we need to deal with all those issues. There are, you know, court rulings and the governor's fighting with the feds on this. Uh, my concern is what's happening locally and uh, making sure that San Mateo County has the capacity to deal with these issues. Um, we are seeking state funding. Senator Hill um, and others, uh, myself included, have been trying to figure out ways to shake some money loose from Sacramento to assist in the construction of a new jail uh, so we have the capacity to deal with these things in San Mateo County. And I think we will ultimately be able to get there. Um, I am concerned, though, just in some of its anecdotal, some of the statistics, statistics are coming through. Um, we have a rise in property crimes in certain, certain parts of our county. Uh, the 280 corridor uh, is, um, in, in some respects, uh, being targeted. Uh, these folks, some are from uh, the you know, folks that commit these acts, some are from the county, some are from outside of the county. I'm not ready to point the finger at realignment as a reason we're seeing this, these issues because crime stats can fluctuate. Uh, I want to step back and analyze all of that before drawing any conclusions, but I've been having a number of conversations with Susan Manheimer, the chief of the San Mateo uh, Police Department, um, who is um, a leader uh, in her own right with the, with the chiefs, not just locally, but, but statewide, and really 
understand how this, how realignment is affecting our local communities because a, a major, it's, it's really an experiment. It's the biggest policy experiment going on, frankly. So there will be follow-up legislation, there will be cleanup, there will be ways to address um, unanticipated effects and mitigate some of the things um, that are occurring. So uh, it'll be a huge issue and, and may actually dominate um, my tenure in the assembly. It's that, it's that big of an issue. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we had a show um, previously on realignment with our local um, police officers, and, and at least from their opinion, they, they felt that it was going as, as well as could be expected if they have the resources and if they have the money um, to, to help people. Right. So is there the, the likelihood that's going to happen? I mean, talking about sending more mm -hmm. money to them to solve the problem. Are they going to? Are you going to? <laughs> Come on, I Kevin. I promise I'm going to solve the problem. Um, uh, let me just say uh, we are always on the lookout for resources to help local communities. And it, there is uh, a larger issue at play that goes beyond just public safety. And this is um, the governor's move toward local control, moving fiscal authority and autonomy to the local level. That's something I support. You're seeing mm -hmm. it with the local control funding formula. You saw it with realignment. I think you are, I would like to see it next extend to cities. So cities have uh, more ability to raise local funds where voters know that the money is staying local. Um, he, uh, I think, just generally supports moving some move, uh, money and autonomy to the local level. The one exception, which puzzles me, is, is the takeaway of redevelopment from right. local communities. If we're going to uh, do all of these things and move that um, impetus, move the money and the decision making local, we also need to give local governments like cities local economic development tools, uh, call it redevelopment, uh, you know, two, something. Mm -hmm. Rebrand it, call it whatever you want, but we need to do some tax increment for local communities so they can build affordable housing at transit and grow um, and do land use uh, within this SB 375 and AB 32 paradigm, sort of a new way of, of doing land use so we address our climate uh, goals. Uh, and, and so we really need to invest in local communities. Your legislative agenda has a fairly modest bill on the issue of redevelopment. Uh, it's a fair to characterize as sort of cleanup of what was done already. But I assume it's a, it's a for, sort of a forerunner to something you'd like to do that's more substantial. And, you know, the big thing that Prop 13 did, other than resolve the rising tax problem for people, was shift taxing authority away from locals. As a former mayor, it sounds like you're in favor of not necessarily reforming Prop 13, but restoring some level of autonomy and authority to local government. Absolutely. And, and it's a particular interest of mine to look at state local finance reform as it affects cities, counties, and schools. The state has been not a governing partner. The state has been viewed as something of an enemy to the work of local government. We all serve the same constituencies. We need to hit the reset button on that relationship between the state and local communities. And I want to engage in a, a long-term process here of reform as a member of the Local Government Committee and Revenue and Taxation Committee and Budget. I sort of, I'm sort of in that nexus, if you will, to be able to uh, move some issues and help us uh, rebuild redevelopment in some capacity without taking money away from schools. Uh, there is a way to do that. There is a way to encourage the right kind of land use um, in a region and in individual communities. So it's certainly something I want to work on. I know we're, we're coming up on, on uh, another break, but I, I want to switch and just ask, how has it been for you um, in this role up at the state since you were so involved locally and, and in mm -hmm. South San Francisco, just it's on a, a more personal level? Sure, it's a great honor. Mm -hmm. I love the job. Um, I'm, I'm glad I took that step uh, to run. It's a great time to be in Sacramento. We have a balanced budget, Proposition 30 passed. I had nothing to do with that other than campaigning locally. But we walked in the door in a very good position, um, benefited by some difficult decisions made by our predecessors um, who had to make some very difficult budget decisions. So we have a balanced budget. Uh, we have a gradually recovering economy. We have 12-year term limits, uh, term mm -hmm. limit reform, which enables some policy expertise, folks to sort of carve out areas that they want to focus on. Uh, we are going, going through uh, potentially a leadership transition. I want to make sure that the next speaker um, cares about state local finance, cares about 
the health of the institution as a whole. So we're developing a set of principles um, for the next speakership uh, going forward because that person could be in place eight or ten years and that will sort of dominate the conversation in my house, the assembly. Um, so it's an exciting time to, <laughs> it's an exciting time to be there. We all want to ask, you know. I'll let you ask that. Speaker Mullen, are you interested? Are you in position to potentially be the speaker? The, the current speaker is about, is termed out, he's about to leave. I, uh, that's something that I've thought about. I think I would probably be more suited for um, being on the leadership team. I'm currently on the leadership team in a relatively junior spot, assistant speaker pro tem. Uh, there are some um, spots up the ladder, if you will, to, on that leadership team where I think I'd be effective, but that really depends on who becomes the next speaker. Uh, so I haven't taken my name out. It's a few folks have thrown that out there. I think I'm a dark horse at best uh, uh, at the moment, but uh, I do want to be on that team and have confidence in that speaker that they're a, a reform-minded speaker who stays grounded uh, and isn't just about sort of playing the, the special interest power game, but is really interested in rebuilding public trust in the institution. I want to be proud of of what we do after uh, 10 or 12 when years. When you're all done there, yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> when you're all done there, of course, the normal thing with, with old term limits is to start thinking immediately about the office you're going to run for next, but you have 12 years to get established. See so you running for governor someday? We, we've all decided you should run for governor. <laughs> and on that I'll note, let you, we'll let you, I'll let you start that. And moment. we're all done with that show. I'm Mark Simon. I'm Kitty Lopez. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Kevin Mullen. And join us next time on The Game.